On this episode of The Notorious POD, I speak with Kevin Oakley about builders, the economy, and the Biden housing plan. This is Notorious POD, the podcast for the best informed people in the real estate industry. Rob Hahn is your host, and Notorious is where the real estate industry comes for real talk with no bullshit. Oh, yeah. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Notorious Pod. I am obviously your host, Rob Hahn. Uh, thanks for joining me. And uh, I'm really excited to have this conversation. Um, I was on his podcast uh, earlier, I want to earlier this month, a couple of weeks ago, maybe. And uh, he's graciously agreed to come on mine so we could continue the conversation. Let me introduce Kevin Oakley. Hey, Kevin, how are you? Hey, Rob. Great to be here. I've, this is, I've been looking forward to this for at least this morning. Since, All since right. this morning, I've been thinking about <laughs> nothing else but you and, and this right here, right now. Right on, man. And uh, Kevin is the managing partner of Do You Convert, which I believe you're. it's like a marketing agency f primarily for builders, right? Exactly. Builders and developers. Collectively, we work with uh, over 65 different organizations in North America, operating in 38 states, everything mm -hmm. from a 50 home a year semi-custom builder up to a um, an $8 billion a year public uh, company. So the entire right gamut. Yep. Right on. And you also are the host of the Market Proof Marketing Podcast. And I think, uh, as we mentioned during the pre-show, the title of your podcast is about to get uh, pretty <laughs> relevant. <laughs> it sure is. <laughs> All right. So I, one of the reasons I'm excited, obviously, you know, we talked, but, you know, builders and, you know, new home construction is not really a, an area, you know, that I've like, because of the real estate industry, you know, tend to think about a whole yeah. lot, right? Obviously, it's very, very connected. So I thought, you know, like, give us a, give us a take of just what's going on with builders with new construction industry right now, twenty twenty two. We're we're all kinds of mixed up, uh, and what I mean by that is costs keep rising, labor and material supply chain is not really fixing itself, and so costs continue to rise. Those costs are trying to be passed on to the consumer, mm -hmm. and still, you know, the last uh, tweet from Ali Wolf from Zonda was that roughly eighty six percent of builders who had a cancellation occur which that number is rising to like 15% of sales canceling uh, for the builders who reported, I think was her number. Mm -hmm. But 86% said, yeah, we can still more or less resell that home for more money uh, very quickly after that cancellation comes in. Mm. And so there's this intense trepidation of everyone understanding that affordability is becoming a concern um, that we're exiting what is typically, you know, in your world, in, in the general real estate world, this is when the market usually starts to heat up. But January through May is when traditionally, you know, up to 70% of home builder sales occur uh, mm. in the pre-sale world because we have to build the home and then they want to move in ideally in that same year. So prices are rising. Uh, land prices are ridiculous, uh, partly due to build to rent and just where else are you going to put your money, uh, which mm -hmm. you've talked a lot about. Yep, And so there's just this intense trepidation and a lot of PTSD from the great financial crisis. So, mm. um, you know, I started my career in real estate in 03 and, and never left it. Um, most people in new construction world left when the great financial crisis hit, became, mm -hmm. uh, did something else and then came back to it. Um, but, but going through that experience makes me more excited for the opportunity ahead because in a down market, that's where builders really have to attack and gain market share. You don't chase market share in a rising market. Now you position yourself to be able to attack in a, in, a, in a declining market to gain market share so that once the tide starts to rise again, you get your unfair share mm -hmm. of that in the future. So it's complicated. And, and I actually, not to jump ahead, but I think the Fed has made it pretty clear that they, they want housing to slow down. And in particular, mm -hmm. I think their, their, their gambit right now is that um, existing homeowners will not be hurt much because real estate market moves so slowly. You think about the great financial crisis, you know, really started peaking. It was, it was Q4 of 07, right? When the world was ending and banks were closing, but real estate didn't bottom out until you, you probably know this better than I do. 2009, 2010. Uh, and the bottom was, I want to say 2011. Actually. Okay. No, 2008, 2008. Yeah. yeah so, and, and so like a 9% decrease in average home price over a two to two and a half year period, not a quick moving market. Like the market for right. toilet paper changed in two weeks 
in 2020. Right. Like that, that was a fast moving market. So I think, but, I think the Fed is saying existing housing owners are not going to be hurt nearly as, as badly, but we're okay if builders take the brunt of this pain. The this thing that's thing. a little weird about, so taking a step back, I mean, obviously when the pandemic hit and everything got shut down, like builders, like y'all just stopped building for a while. For about three weeks, good. all permits right. were paused, land contracts. Hey, thank you. You keep that $500,000 and I'll just walk away. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Um, and then Sales teams uh, were fired. Right. And then, you know, during what, like last year, maybe, you know, there was a huge thing about building materials, like wood prices tripling or 10 xing or whatever it is. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, is that all done now? Like as we're no. entering 2022? That, like, that's, that's the big fear is this is still continuing to work through as the as the overall interest in the market is cooling. So we we both are all the builders we work with and builders we don't, we get an aggregate data report where we can see mm -hmm. in real time what's happening on home builder websites in terms of visits and conversion activity. Right. And all organic visits, meaning non-paid, non-advertising channels that's driving the consumer on their own, with their own intent and their own fingertips to home builders, is year over year down 25% right now. Uh, wow. So the innate demand is absolutely cooling, but at the same time, builders are not getting the relief they need on costs and materials. So this goes to the affordability thing, right? I mean, existing homes, you know, affordability going through the roof, like, okay, it's a scarce asset, blah, blah, blah. You know, and there's that whole saying, like, you know, economics, one of the laws of economics, especially if you're an Austrian like me, the Amen. cure for high prices is high <laughs> prices, right? Because yeah. when you see home prices going up 15, 20% a year, <clears throat> all of a sudden it should be like, we should build houses. So, you know, but we're not, we haven't really seen that. Like, what's the explanation? Well, it's not because we don't want to, it's because builders have been unable to. And and when I interviewed Ivy and, and other economics uh, experts on my podcast, we all kind of chuckle and agree that if builders could build what they wanted to build, we've already been in a recession in construction. Like we would have, mm. so, so this whole narrative of, why don't builders want to build? We absolutely do. That's that's that's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's your whole purpose in life. <laughs> but the challenge is, even if you get the land for free, mo in most parts of the country, if the land was free, right. between taxes and and zoning restrictions and material costs, you could not deliver a single family home for less than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. It would be impossible if the land were free. And of course, land is still in most cases. Uh, twenty to six, fifteen to twenty percent of your overall cost of goods as a builder, right? And what's going on with the labor situation? Because uh, you know, obviously, the great <laughs> re resignation, all of that. I know a lot of it hit construction. You know, it's it's a tough, <laughs> it's it's not an easy job, right? Yeah, with, well, no one wants like, to talk about it this way, but I don't, I don't, I, I'm happy to. When the great financial crisis hit, our labor all went back to the country that they were born in. Unfortunately. And they have not been able to make their way back, nor did they necessarily need to make their way back in the same way that they did before. So we have a huge immigration problem. Like we could solve two problems at once. We could we could make labor uh, more affordable for home builders. Uh, we could solve our, our demographic challenges in, in the not too distant future. But immigration being what it is, um, la labor is, like I think the silver lining for builders could be that if as we go into a recession, it's not if, it's, it's when, are we there yeah. now or when. Yeah. Um, we, we'll get some relief on the material side for sure. I mean, you're already right. seeing that in, in some industries, but labor is still going to be a challenge uh, for, for the foreseeable future. I mean, and people like Mike Rowe and, and others yeah. have been really yeah. encouraging people to go into this workforce, but um, it's just not happening the way it, it's kind of like watching what happened to uh, gasoline and, and the ESG movement. You can see this thing coming a mile away that's going to hit us. I mean, when's the last time you had any contractor for any repair work or or new work in your home who walked in who was under the age of thirty five, and and was the owner of the business? Uh, yeah, it's just yeah. I want to say, you know what? Most recently, I actually had a couple of young guys in their twenties show up doing solar panel installation. Hmm. So maybe, maybe. So that's part of the question I have is what's what do builders think is the reason for this labor shortage? Is it just cultural? Is it our educational system? Is it like, what is it? Like, why aren't, because it pays really well. <laughs> it absolutely pays and, <laughs> and pays better every day. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the builders that I spent most time with, uh, the builder I worked for, I was a home builder myself for the first 12 years of my career. 
And we were acquired by a public company, NVR. They're the <clears throat> fifth yeah. largest builder in the country. Yeah. And and a good, gosh, 60% of my time managing two divisions for that organization in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania was, was myself and my team going to other states recruiting labor to come into Pittsburgh from Virginia, from Tennessee, from other places. And as soon as we would get a framing crew in, mm-hmm. uh, another builder would just show up down the street and say, hey, thanks for bringing them here. We'll give you a $10,000 bonus to just leave the job site right now and come to ours. Wow. And and so in 2015, I was dealing with the same things in Pittsburgh that the whole country is dealing with now. Um, there's not enough interest in it. Uh, I don't want to go down the typical tropes of kids today just don't want to work hard. I don't think that's true. But I think um, a lot of parents would not be excited to hear that that their son or daughter is thinking about becoming a residential plumber. Um, you see, so you think it's just cultural? Um, cultural combined with, uh, yeah, uh, c- combined with the narrative still not being out there of, of what does this money really mean? Like mm. money per hour worked. Uh, and what kind of work is it? It's manual labor. I'm going to sweat. I'm going to, um, but, but I think the narrative has to switch to a lot of people in tech jobs struggle with um, the value that they're delivering every day in their jobs. Right. And that's part of the great resignation is like, um, my job is still happening, even though I'm zooming in and I only work half the day and I do my laundry and other things, the other half, my job keeps getting done. So how hard is my job really? What am I contributing to it? What purpose do I have in this? And let's go do something more meaningful. And I think that yeah. from of, you can leave every day knowing exactly the impact you had in the world and get paid really well for it. Like, yeah. I, I don't know about you, Rob, but there's days where I think, man, I wish I could just go back for an hour and flip burgers. I would know exactly. Okay, I, don't, I don't do flip burgers, <laughs> but I will tell you. So here's the interesting. Like, I've been really trying to push my, I have two boys. One's 16, one's 13. And I've been trying to push them towards uh, the skilled trades, you know? Because um, I'm kind of like, look, uh, you know, I work with spreadsheets. I'm a, I, this is what I, you know, this is my work. Like, there are a lot of times where I want to work with my hands. I want to produce yeah. something. I want to make something. Um, and that was one. The other one was for me, and I, I started this 10 years ago. I thought, you know what? Um, the one job you can't outsource is plumbing. Right, skilled trades cannot be outsourced to India. Can't be done. Do you yep. know what I mean? Yep. So I felt like, look, even if you want to be a computer programmer, if you want to be an economist, you want to be a lawyer, you want to be a doctor, great. Do those things, but maybe get you know get uh, credentials. You know, get your electrician yeah. license, get your plumber's license, get that, because you never know what's going to no. happen. And, and, and yeah. Well, to, to your point, I saw someone on Twitter today say they wanted to be an architect when they grew up, and then their mentor said, "Why don't you just be the person who hires the architect?" Mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. Go, and um, same same thing. If you were a plumber, but not just a grid plumber, but a plumber who can read, write, communicate, yeah, uh, show empathy to the customer, uh, be a business owner, yeah, you can ten x your money because there's yeah. there's again there's a whole bunch of people out there who you could recruit and train to become a great painter or yeah. or plumber or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But it's the entrepreneurial combination that you yeah. could 10x the income that you're making. Yeah. So there's a part of me, if I go back, it's not, I don't want to necessarily flip burgers, but there, if I could go back, I would think like, why, why didn't I look at maybe getting electrician certificate? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, because trade schools, at least back when I was, you know, 18, 19, I think it would have taken me maybe a year, you know? And it was way cheaper than Yale. I'll tell you that. <laughs> like, Yeah. And so and we, know, we know we my know politicians aren't going to be this creative, Rob. But if we're going to, you know, uh, forgive ten ten thousand dollars of college education, why don't we also incentivize the same dollar amount out the door of incentivizing, you know, ten thousand dollars towards going yeah. to a trade school? Yeah, yeah. I, but okay, so labor still remains a major problem, and just because it's a cultural narrative thing i mean yeah, and manufacturing is not a way out either so i know no. um you were joking that you're ready for gundam to to come but that that's not the, the building materials that go into homes are not precise enough to manufacture the same way that cars are manufactured yet um, okay like one of the builders that i worked for uh they were panelizing everything as much as possible and they actually went to steel framing in 2006 
for only one reason. It wasn't because steel was less expensive or better. It was just the the using steel as a material for the machines that he'd get a more consistent material in the factory to produce mm. a better result. Mm. We're talking about wood chips and and all. I mean, it's the, the complexity level. When people say, "Why isn't there more innovation uh, in how homes are constructed?" Um, I mean, again, the the, the silly story, but it, it is true. Imagine if your Ford uh, Expedition was built outside in your driveway in front of you mm. and you saw every bolt being put together and every person who worked on that vehicle, you know, with their saggy pants or misshapen hair or whatever, would you as a customer think, I want to spend 85 grand on that car? Mm. Um, and And so... There's complexity from material standpoint. There's complexity in terms of the number of SKUs or product offerings. Um, you know, if there's 450 different plumbing components, does the plumber, when he comes up to do a repair or to to install something, is he going to have all 450 parts in his car? Right. No. Right. He's he's not. Um, right. So I think people. That, that's why when people from outside industry come in and they're like, "This is going to be easy. I'm gonna I'm just going to do my tech thing, and houses right. are going to spit out in the physical real world." Right. We're a ways off from solving that. All right. So that gets us to one of the major topics I wanted to talk to you about. And this kind of came about recently, right? Which is, uh, and I just did a musings. I think you mentioned you watched it. The new Biden housing plan. I, I'm not. Do we have to use air quotes when we, when we say this? Or? No, I don't. It's, you know, here's the <laughs> the thing housing about, like, plan. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an expert enough in that area because there's so many components of it, right? And I'm, I'm like, okay, I don't you know, low income housing tax credit, like there's, there are people who spend their entire career just studying that, you know, plus hope and home and all these different programs at the federal level, Mm -hmm. all this complexity. But what I did kind of zone in on was, it seemed to me, so you tell me, I mean, I don't know if you've read it, but it seemed to me that most housing plan was talking about manufactured housing, ADUs, and small multifamily. There wasn't Mm -hmm. a whole lot in there about single family residential, Except in one area where they talked about um, construction uh, to, I can't remember what the term is. Construction to perm? Yeah, construction to permanent loans in rural mm-hmm. areas, mm-hmm. right? Uh, so from a builder's perspective, what do you think this plant, housing plan, like how do you think builders see this housing plan? Like what, what am I missing about sort of that overall plan? What's your take on it? Um, well, your, your take was was correct in that it's really focused on this concept of creating the place, uh, creating shelter, not creating home ownership, and that's a big miss. Like, mm-hmm. in nor- you can't un- overstate what kind of a miss that is in terms of what's what's necessary. And one of the things that I know you said, like, it was focused on rural areas and manufactured housing. Why would that yeah. be? Yeah. Because they can't change zoning laws for places that have restrictive zoning laws, like. There's nothing preventing most people from putting an ADU in their backyard now, except for the fact that your local zoning code won't let you. Um, and so they're they're doing a couple things. Is the, the the one part of it that I think does connect is if you look at a, a operation like Clayton Homes, which is owned by Berkshire Hathaway, manufactured housing, and traditionally one of the reasons that apparently I was told this could be. Mm-hmm. Uh, a fable so warren buffett liked this business because in order to get financing for the product they're like well, we'll just take care of that like we know it's hard for you to get a loan for a manufactured product like this and so we will self-finance and make money mm-hmm. off the loan too right but but now as those costs have increased and they're trying to pivot the the way the product comes out to say we'll put it on a foundation if we if we can or, or need to to try to make it more like a permanent home versus um you know the the stereotypical double wide uh, stigma then then that's a big win for those folks who can start to offer traditional mortgage type products for manufactured homes of that type. So one thing I was thinking about, like before the show, like, you know, I literally mentioned EJ, my producer, who's doing producing this show for us right now in my musings, right? Because EJ's in his 20s and he's a wonderful young man, you know, with his mm-hmm. girlfriend, like, mm-hmm. and my whole thing was, I felt like this housing plan was telling young people, your American dream should be manufactured housing or an ADU or two to four, you know, like multifamily. Like that's, yeah. that sucks. You know, I don't, I don't want that. Right. And we had a little conversation before and he confirmed, look, the American dream still is a house 
with a backyard, white picket fence, a dog, barbecue, Absolutely. you know, raised family. Like that's still the American dream. Mm -hmm. It's just that for younger people, they literally think this is not achievable, right? So they're like, it's still, it's just a dream, not reality. I don't mean to be negative, but explain to me how it is achievable for most of them. I, I agree. And that sucks. So, it, but my point is the dream <laughs> has still remained the same. The dream mm -hmm. is still yeah, single on their end, house, it's still there. backyard, right? And yep. that's, that was the same for us as it was for our parents' generation, for them. Like nobody goes, my dream is one bedroom apartment in, you know, it, nobody thinks that way. Right. Um, so from that standpoint, I felt like this, the housing plan, to, it, it's just manufactured housing, et cetera. Having said that, let me try and steel man this. Okay? okay. Is it possible that the Biden administration, when they talk about manufactured housing, they don't mean trailer parks. They mean sort of the newer sort of, you know, like actual things that look like single family homes. Mm -hmm. It's just that they're manufactured. I mean, is that a possible interpretation or uh, how to? Um, how it it is. Happen? But again, th that's where zoning laws in a lot of cases where you would want to put those and where those millennials and, and Gen Z would like to have those placed. It's mm. not, it's not, I mean, they're, do never put it past a local politician. I know you're a big fan of, of federal politicians, Rob. Uh, local <laughs> politicians are not much different. Um, in fact, I, I was interacting with someone who was on a local zoning board and I said, you know, I've, I've kind of felt the pull that I probably should get involved in local zoning, but I just, man, I, I, I'm a libertarian. I don't, I don't really want to get anywhere involved. And her point was, well, if it's not you, Kevin, then it's like some, you know, retired doctor who's a semi-professional tennis player Mm -hmm. who's looking at a plat map and making a, a completely uninformed decision about something that is impacting people's lives. And, you know, that that's just where right. 2004, one of the builders I worked with here in central Ohio was going in an area that had better schools, but they were a cost uh, effective builder. Mm -hmm. And the local zoning board started passing rules saying, you must have an exterior, you know, a, a full functional fireplace. You must mm -hmm. have this type of, of window. You must have specifically to keep that, that builder out of that area. So, yeah, I mean, we know this, right? But here's, here's the counter to that, which is mm -hmm. local zoning boards, local politicians are going to respond to incentives from the local voter base. Mm -hmm. So, in a way, we can't even blame the politicians and the zoning board. We can't blame them because they're just responding to what their neighbors want them to do what their neighbors want to do is keep out the riffraff to keep their values high. I mean, in other words, it's about nimbyism, right? For sure. So to some extent, you have to go, yeah, I want to blame the local zoning boards, but fact is they're just responding to what their neighbors want them to do. So really, it's the fault of the neighborhood. It's the fault of the community. Well, yeah, that's why, I, I, to me, that's where this is the same situation, though, Rob, as ESG and, and right. all of that. Like, whose fault is it then that we don't have gas that we can pump for less than $3 a gallon? Right. I mean, <laughs> yeah, but see, like, here's where it's different. ESG and all of that to me is still kind of a multinational, big finance, top down uh -huh. pro problem. Whereas uh -huh. housing and zoning is a local bottom up problem. We're, it's same right? from a different direction. Yeah. Right. But mm -hmm. that does make a difference. So ESG, you can't, you know, like it's easier to fix, if you will, because yep. it's, you know, it's the Goldman Sachs and it's the World Economic Forum and it's, you know, it's those big, then, big, big funds, if, right? If that's the case, Rob, because I know you've talked about like your boys and and as those of us who are who are getting older and have kids, mm -hmm. then is that going to start changing our views because of our kids and their situations and not being able to have a house? Like, is there yeah. ever the potential that then, you know, I don't want renters to live in my neighborhood, right? but now when all of my kids are renters because they can't be owners, does that change the perception of what a renter is? I, I think that's possible. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, what is, I think the way to work out is it'll filter up again, bottom up. But the secondary problem with that is I feel that, and this is something I've been yelling about for a long time, man, right? If 50% of the population are renters, we have a very different politics. Mm -hmm. right? And it's not likely to be good. You know, in other words, we're going to have rent control, not incentivizing builders to build more homes, right? I mean, it's yeah. just... The government, you know, the politician, the politician, and they're going to do the easiest thing, and they're going to virtue signal, yep. right? Let, let me ask you this um, question, Rob. Do, yeah. Do you think we have a homelessness issue uh, that is that is caused by a lack of physical shelter? No, of course not. No, I've never thought so, that. So, what is this narrative about? We don't have enough homes uh, about because I think it's the narrative is a politically motivated one. 
And I think it's simply we don't have enough homes where young people want to live. We don't have enough homes where people want to live. And the reason why we don't have enough homes where people want to live predominantly has to do with the people who are already there. Mm-hmm. Right? In other words, the NIMBY problem, right? They don't want the young people moving into the neighborhoods. They don't, they don't want their property values to go down. Um, so it's this infinite loop. Because, uh, you know, here I am in Las Vegas, right? You drive an hour outside of Las Vegas and it's empty desert land as far as the eye can see. If we really wanted to build homes for young people, then we just lay the road sewer, elect- you know what I mean? Like do the utilities, do the basic fundamental infrastructure. We could put up 10,000 homes. It's yeah. just an hour outside. And a lot of people, are, I don't want to live there. It's it's empty wasteland. Well, and that's because, you know, when you when you talk about like the rings of communities and development and how, how it rings out, yeah. the, the exponent, the savings difference or the affordability difference between those rings is not high enough. And no. that, that's where we keep coming back to, even out there in the middle of the desert. Right. It's going to be 35 grand less expensive than Correct. somewhere that's on the edge of of the of the suburban landscape. And that's but then I look not- at like say the Houston area, right? Where which mm-hmm. famously has no zoning, right? I I, I there's a part of that feels like we kept you know Houston has managed to keep prices relatively low and build lots of homes. Why? Cuz they don't have to your point the zoning and the permissions and the you know, permits and all of that, right? Yep. Um so fundamentally, I suppose if we wanted to solve the affordability problem, I hate to say it like this, but it's it takes a Supreme Court decision mm. to overrule. I can't remember the name of the case, but where they said zoning was constitutional, constitutional. right? Mm-hmm. Um, but then when we look at where does zoning come from, I mean, it came from racism. <laughs> There's no two ways about it. Like exclusion mm. zoning came from white people wanting to keep black people out of their neighborhoods. It's that simple. And if we're not going to deal with that, then it is what it is, right? Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, maybe it does take more of a cultural, social change, you know, almost like the way we think about, say, gay marriage, right? Yeah. You know, where we as a, as a people, as a country just said, yeah, what, what the hell are we arguing over? If they want to get married, who cares? Let them get married. Maybe it needs to have that change. Say, why? Why are we even? Well, that, that's where I think I don't. I don't think we're going to ever address affordable housing until we have an actual issue with people being homeless due to a lack of shelter, and that's not the world yeah. we live in. Yeah, I, and I don't think that'll ever happen, right? Because homelessness is not caused by lack of housing. Homelessness is caused by drug addiction and mental illness. Yeah, l- louder for the people in the back, please, Rob. But that's that's not the narrative. Right. That you uh, that's hear. not the narrative, but that's because the, nar- the narrative then becomes this, right? But again, if I'm a politician, I just want to get votes. I go to people and say, look, all these greedy landlords, the, the builders, the realtors, they're at fault, right? Not me. They're at fault. And what I'm going to do when you elect me, I'm going to put in rent control. I'm going to put in regulations and laws that prevent. And, and that's a big part of the housing plan, speaking of yep. the housing plan, where they talk about investors aren't going to have access to whatever. We're going to prioritize ho- ownership and nonprofits. And I'm like, I guess, you know. We're just going to create more rental units with that plan. And, yeah. you know, a couple of things that might be surprising to your audience is that most of the builders who wrote contracts for new homes in 2020 mm-hmm. lost money or broke even. Mm. If you wrote a contract and the way that we, we do things as builders is we say, Rob, in seven months, I'm going to deliver this home to you and you give me $600,000. And then as prices increased, most builders who wrote contracts like that lost money. And so escalation mm. clauses were put in place things pegged to where different material prices were, were put into place. And, and the big thing that I think a lot of people don't want to listen to right now is that the majority of home builders as of middle, middle of January of this year said, I'm no longer going to sell homes to customers Mm -hmm. until they are at drywall or beyond. Mm -hmm. Which then leads to the, the thing that you touched on and it's a big topic built to rent. Yes. Right. Well, b- built to rent. And then also there's, there's 815,000 single family homes under construction right now. Wow. Okay. Uh, which is about 35% more than 2019 pre pandemic. Mm-hmm. Right now, the conversion rate on leads or interest for homes is flat and even as of today with 2019, May of 2019. So 
there is this unseen, unknowable number in terms of total value, but roughly mm -hmm. both Zelman and I agree on this, that about 30 to 35% of those homes are unsold. Okay. Shadow inventory that could hit the market at any time. And as the market gets tougher, is more likely to all hit at once. It won't be complete at once, but it'll go for sale all at mm -hmm. one time with right. a little bit of a panic. And that's that's what... And which will then drive prices down for those homes, which maybe is how we get to housing affordability. I think that's maybe. what the Fed really wants to have happen, right? But here's the issue. Okay, so the Fed really wants to make that happen. They make that happen. So how many home, how many home builders stay in business after that happens? Depends on how long that pause button hits, but most of them are going to have healthy backlogs. I mean, there are builders right now, typically a home builder has a net margin of 10% if they're one of the top 50 builders in, in the world. That would be a great margin in a normal marketplace, around 10% net. Mm -hmm. um, and to get that, they typically would have around a 24 to 28% gross margin. Okay. There are builders today who have gross margins in the 40s. And wow. they're crying to the consumer. They're crying to everyone. Oh my gosh, it's so expensive. And in the background, they are, they are making a lot of money. Those, those folks will be okay. The builders who got a business, again, are the ones who were chasing volume in a low margin environment. Mm. And that is a recipe for going out of business when the market changes. Mm. Um, so there will be builders who won't, who won't make the pivot. And, and that's something where it's been probably two decades almost since um, since home builders had to deal with having a glut of inventory, finished inventory on the ground. True. And so that narrative is completely outside of, of their world. But I think the Fed, here, here's what I think is also interesting, and I would love to get your perspective on uh, yeah. selfishly, is I think the Fed has t tools that no one's really talking about yet to impact housing directly while still keeping overall rates lower for the industry. And I think they can do that uh, specifically with the mortgage-backed securities that they've already bought. And, and, and Talk to what do you mean by that? So, you know, I, I think the number is somewhere in the 3 trillion range of mortgage-backed securities that were purchased during the pandemic. And when they did mm -hmm. that, uh, banks created loans of mortgages, said, here you go, Fed. Fed buys them at whatever amount they want. And that adds liquidity to our world. More money is, is right, magically right. created. So they have this sitting on their balance sheet. And Jay Powell has said that they're going to start selling roughly right. 90 billion of those a month uh, very right. soon. And right. his last press conference, when he announced the 50% rate hike, he said, go, go back to the quote on this. He's like, we have no idea how that will impact the housing market, mortgage rates, or rates generally speaking. Mm -hmm. We have no idea. It could be an extra quarter of a point. It could be 50, but essentially to those who want to buy mortgage-backed securities, there will be a glut available to, to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, so that could give them an ability to kind of push at housing specifically while still keeping rates uh, at a different level for the rest of, 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 economy. of the economy. The thing I don't understand about that, and I'm not smart enough, and I think maybe, you know, go ask Ivy Zellman, right? Maybe go ask uh, some of the more, people understand the bond market. What I don't understand is, all right, the Fed's going to start selling mortgages out of a coupon rate of like 3%, right? Because mm -hmm. they're before. Who's bidding on those? Well, this is the same argument from people who say, why keep cash, Rob? And I, and right. I, I this is one one part where I think it's the only thing maybe we dis disagree on. And I, and I love um, all the other asset classes that I know you're a fan of. But at the same time, I look at the cash that I have sitting on the sidelines and I say, I'm not losing what I'm losing in the stock market right now mm -hmm. or in, in other potential things. So I, again, um, you could buy a treasury, you could buy a mortgage-backed security. Um, I, I, I don't know. That, that, that's really the other scary thing is that still the Fed is buying treasuries. They stopped buying mortgages. They are still like, don't you think it's weird that um, the 10-year rate continues to fall despite mm -hmm. mass panic and sell-off in in uh, and, and people pulling out cash. I mean, they're, they're creating stockpiles of cash. They're not putting it into something else or something would be up. Right now, everything is just down. Mm -hmm. um, but yet rates keep falling. And that's because the Fed is still buying treasuries. We do not know what the open market rate is for treasuries. And that means- Yeah, that no, it's yield curve control for sure. Yeah. I, I'm just getting that, like cash though, is the difference in cash and bonds, I suppose cash still has ultimate optionality. Mm -hmm. right? So if I'm like, okay, look, I'm going to lose- 8% this year if I hold it in cash, but it gives me the 
flexibility if some you know something happens i could swoop in and right yeah if you buy, if you buy mortgage backs you don't have as much you know what i mean like no i, I totally and, and it's the same it's the same thing about treasuries but i'm i'm what what I'm, what we're saying is if the if the economy really goes to a bad place three percent is yeah. not going to look bad again i mean it's, it's gonna think? it's possible and, and again the point is even the fed himself the chairman right. of the fed said we do not know because this has never been done what the impact yeah. to the market is going to be. I, I, like I said, I'm not an expert enough thing on the bond market and how that functions, right? But I just look at it much more simply. Today's rates are 5.5%. Yeah. So if I have, whatever, $10 million, why wouldn't I buy today's mortgages at 5.5%? To your point, if recession is really coming, yep. why would I buy... Well, you know, maybe the great the financial crisis that's paying three. Like, why maybe, would I do that? Maybe the GFC has a clue for us there, Robin. That do you think the security of 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 the default rate being really low on three percent is better than the default rate being higher on five and a half? Mm, okay, okay. Maybe maybe, maybe the maybe. people buying right now are stretching in a way that people weren't stretching before. Yeah, and that makes those mortgages riskier. Maybe. That must be something because I, yeah, I know about like, hey, quantitate. I like, sell who was buying stuff. treasuries buying? when they were giving 1%? I, I think that's another major question I have. Like, what? What? It was and, the and I've asked, I asked friends of mine who are Wall Street, you know, hedge fund guys, yeah. and their answer literally was there are bond funds in their charter are required to buy bonds. Hmm. <laughs> like, that was their answer. Right. That was one. Yeah. And then the other one was a number of hedge funds, insurance companies, you know, this portfolio theory said you have to hold 40% in bonds. So the safest risk-free rate was treasuries. Yeah. We'll see what happens. But the biggest right. buyer was the government and they're going to exit the market sure. in June. So just, I mean, if I was a home builder still right now, and I, I just put out a note to all of our builders, I would be actively trying to make sure that I had as little to, to know unsold under construction homes as possible by the end of June. Wow. And that's hmm. a tip. I, I have, I have builders that I work with in other States who right now their position is I've got a hundred homes under construction. I'm not, I'm not worried because whenever it's complete, it sells at whatever price I ask. So let me ask you this. <laughs> you said, you said there's 800,000, whatever homes. Yeah, that's from calculated risk. Um, right. Um, and 35% of shadow inventory that's just completely unsold is just hanging out, right? Mm -hmm. What's the nominal value of all of those? That's the, again, that's the unknown. I mean, I mean, are we talking 30 billion, 100 billion, a trillion? Like, what are we looking at? My hunch would be that the average sales price of that would be roughly 600,000. Okay. So, so what is that? 4.8 trillion? I can't, I can't do It's a math. lot of money. <laughs> the reason why I ask is, um, one way is what's so interesting is uh, I, I did an industry relations this morning with Saul Klein and he started talking about futures market and mortgages. And I'm like, futures market exists for producers. So I guess what I'm wondering is, could there be such a thing as a futures market for home builders? Hmm. Right. Where a big enough institution probably. comes in. So, okay. You're producing these homes. You're going to deliver it in nine months. Right. Well, that's the build the uh, rent market actually. What's that? That's that's the build to rent market or a portion of it. I mean, there's two parts to build to rent. There are the people who are starting their own communities from scratch and saying that's what it's going to be, mm -hmm. and then you've got the other players who are who who. And this has gone on for for a long time. I mean, the Dr. Hortons of the world, the LGIs of the world, who build predominantly speculative inventory homes. At the end of every quarter, someone knocks on their door and says, "You got any unsold inventory? Yes, we've got sixty of them." Hey, we'll take all 60 off your hands right now. We just need a discount of X off the price. Right. And and so there's two different buyers of last resorts. One is just intentionally from the beginning saying, let's let's lock in a price. But what's str struggle for builder there is a lot of times those are coming now with terms of how fast those units need to be built. Mm -hmm. And builders are like, yeah, I mean, I, I know one gentleman who is a, a spouse of someone that works for us. I think his job is to build 60 single family homes in less than three months. Okay. All the same one, but he's got to like get on it. He's got to deliver the product. Right. <laughs> yeah. I guess what I'm wondering is a company like open door, mm -hmm. basically filling that role, right? Creating the futures market where you go to builders and say, listen, <clears throat> some builder says, I just got, I just bought 300 acres in, you know, Travis County. Cool. I just got permitted. 
here's what I'm going to build. Here's what I want to do. Here's how much money I need to make in order for this to make sense for me. Right. And the role of a finance, of a market maker, of a futures market participant, then is to say, okay, cool. I'll pay you that because I'm betting that when it comes time to deliver this, it will be higher than what I've just paid you. Right. Uh And I'm going to take that risk. Built to rent does that, I guess, to your point, by saying, I'm going to rent these out and then rentals are going to be higher because young people can't afford to buy shit. Right. Flip side of it could be, a, mar- a true market maker says, I'll, I'll pay you that builder because I'm betting that I'm going to be able to make money on it, but I'm going to sell those to families, right? Hmm. Like, is that possible? I guess um, right. it, it, it would be possible, although not probable. And here's why, is okay. that the amount of equity or, or risk that you are putting on the table, and this is why home building as a business just really doesn't make sense to a lot of people. I mean, our... When I talk to someone uh, in the advertising world and they look at how much revenue a home builder brings in in the course of a year, in their minds, they're thinking, you know, holy cow, that company's bringing in $200 million. I bet they spend like three, $4 million a year in advertising. Mm-hmm. No. No. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it's every little bit. So, so the amount of risk that you're taking on and that's what's happening. The struggle that's happened over the last two years is... There is no shortage of people coming in talking to builders saying, uh, you just become a producer of homes. I'll take care of everything else. And and the builder looks at it and says, I've got $3 million in a personal guarantee on the dirt, let alone the construction of this. Mm-hmm. I need to make X for this to make sense. And, right. and, and to be sure, some people are, I would just say they're using that as a way to hedge the risk as a home building organization not really from a strategic sense. It's it's more of a hedging of risk or a way to get enough economies of scale to try to drive down some of your costs on the stuff that you're not giving that market producer. But when someone comes to a builder and says, I'm going to turn this into a rental project and I want you to build it, what is missing is the builder's understanding of what the rentals are going to be. Meaning they're just saying to the builder, I'll, I'll let you do this for cost plus 10. Mm-hmm. And so the builder has to say, okay, there's certainty in that, but my margin is significantly lower. And so mm-hmm. very few people are willing to commit too much to that because they want to... But isn't this the same problem that, let's say, farmers face, right? Hmm. It feels very similar. In other words, like, okay, seed price going up, diesel price going up, this is what's happening. But I know that if I plant, spend whatever, this much money to plant yep. corn in the spring, in the fall, I need to make this much money from my sales and yeah. I want to lock in that, that price yep. and that's the futures market. So I'm just wondering why we don't have that. But the difference the is um, you might sell your corn for more or less, but your corn's going to be sold. Right. Uh, whereas builders have a much, may, maybe irrational from, from your perspective or others, but their fear is no one may want my corn. Correct. Right. So what it I'm saying is worth that, that, that feels zero. like, that feels like an amazing opportunity for a market to say, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna guarantee, right? Yep. There'll be, you're gonna sell all sixty units. I will buy them mm-hmm. at this price, and if that's good enough for you, then you should sign this futures contract. And I guess that, that so, so again, we're we're getting to the point of agreement here. I just want to add yes. the clarification of, unlike a farmer, a builder knows the difference between their A locations and their C locations all mm-hmm. day long. A builder would take. You know, the deal either won't get done or they'll take that deal right? because it's a C location, marginal, on the fringe. Right. So if I can make a, an X amount of, of money per unit, thumbs up to that. Right. But the, but the A location that I know demand will never be a problem for, Right. there is zero reason for me to do that when I have the chance to make 40% margins. And so right, they, right. there's more visibility right. to the risk than whereas a farmer is like, I don't know, is it going to rain? Right. I, <laughs> right. I just don't <laughs> okay. know. But I think I think I think it's an interesting idea for yeah. sure. Someone needs yeah. to to keep working on that and give us five percent each for helping them think through. I know, right? Uh, and like I said, and that to me was the the idea orig- for me was uh, behind the market makers like an open door, right? Was to <laughs> almost create that futures market. You know, not now. I know when they were getting into, it, they weren't thinking new ho- new home builders. But you see the amount of engagement that new home builders have with open door. Well, not not just engagement. The amount of market share that new construction has right now, because there's right. not enough homes being right being sold. Right. On, on so the it's. Side. 
I don't know. It's a, it's a really interesting f- dilemma. But, you know, fundamentally, I guess the way I sort of see it is everything that you hear from economists, from, house, from everybody is we have a supply problem. We have a supply problem, right? There's a shortage of housing. Okay, well then, shouldn't we do everything in the fucking world to incentivize builders to build housing? Right. And it doesn't feel like we're really doing that. I think that's, no, that's my issue, right? With Biden housing plan, like we're going to incentivize manufactured housing and ADUs. I'm like, but that's not what people want, right? The market you can't even build a, a community of tiny homes in most areas, like actual right. real homes on real foundations that just happen right. to only have one bedroom. Sorry. Right. So then it's like when you go all the way down, it's like, look, the problem is local zoning, local laws, local regulations, all these permits, all this gatekeeping, all this bullshit. And that's a result of local community. So it's like. Yeah, I know we shouldn't bring up his name, especially right at this moment. But Elon Musk, you know, uh, apparently had a call when he invented the boring company. Part of his Mm -hmm. concept was uh, he got on a call again, could be a fable. And was trying to get other wealthy individuals to go buy as much land in the middle of nowhere as possible, saying, mm-hmm. we, we, we get 100,000 acres under our control, and I will build a tunnel right. from LA or Vegas to there that will take right. someone you know, 15 minutes to get to. Right. And if we go far enough out where there are no regulations, then we can actually make something affordable. Right. <clears throat> uh, but other than that, good, good luck right now. So let's, let's actually try and white pill the na- la- next you know, as we wrap up. So here's my white pill, right? It's because you brought this up, Elon Musk, and I was having this conversation with uh, some friends of mine in Canada, right? Talking Because Canada's got a huge, afford- like our afford- housing affordability problem actually pales in comparison to what Canadians are dealing with. And that's because right? the Canadian housing market, this is just my opinion, but feel free to react yeah. on Twitter. The Canadian housing market is just like the Chinese housing market and is going to proceed down the same path as the Chinese housing market is doing right now at some point. What do you mean by that? I mean that in China, it, you you rush, you used to rush to purchase a unit because your equity in that unit would increase. And so whether you could rent it out for what you wanted to or not was a secondary consideration. It was get in so that you, the equity is growing. And then if I can rent it, awesome. So oversupply... Okay. Not empty buildings, okay. but the the narrative was get in on it because. And I talked to a lady at a conference I was at last week. She owns thirty units. Just a lady. She has thir- thirty doors. As she talked about it. She's a banker, but she got into real estate. Mm-hmm. And what happens in most new housing projects get released in Canada is they sell out instantly, mostly to brokers and agents, who then take their cut and sell it to an investor. Mm-hmm. who takes turns it into a rental. Wow, uh, okay. But the equity is what's growing. And so the narrative is there's no risk here. You just put your money in, the equity grows, you get a renter. Okay. And the other weird thing that, that makes me feel this way, Rob, is that in the US, builders and developers understand that you can only sell something once, mm-hmm. as of right now. <laughs> I got some other things on that that we could talk about later. But <laughs> we can only make money once when we sell the home. So maximize the margin on each one. In Canada, right. in Toronto and Vancouver, it's a completely different story. They don't care what the margin is because they're so highly levered on each project. It has to sell and sell fast. Mm-hmm. And all those things are big red warning flags to me. Of yeah. That is not a sustainable marketplace and, and likely to follow what's happened in China. Right. All right. No, so, so for me, like, you know, that's, that's actually a really interesting point. For me, the thing with the Canadian housing market really was... In the U.S., we have people living all across the U.S. In Canada, you have people living in yeah. a very narrow band <laughs> mm-hmm. along their southern border because you go north of that and it's just, you know, frozen, like, wasteland, like, no one can actually live there. But the conversation we were having, to bring it back to kind of what, the white pill part, as I said, <clears throat> you know, it could be that Starlink is going to change everything. Right, because you have work from home, you have these types of things. But you know, it could be that when when high speed internet is available, no matter where you live, because it's all coming through a satellite or whatever, and we don't mm-hmm. have to spend the money to lay down fiber and all of the infrastructure, it could be that you could really have a viable bedroom community in the middle of the frozen tundra, as long as you know you yeah. have other amenities, and everyone can go to work in Toronto and Vancouver as long as they can work. All you, you know, need is your remote. mini fusion reactor, your Starlink, 
and um, and a septic system. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> you know. So then we don't need the boring company's tunnel, you know, to physically. Right. And so there, I don't know. Like, so the one of the white pill things I've got is, and I think about like Nevada, right? Like Nevada is an empty state. Like this state is com- like you have Vegas, yeah. you got like two, <laughs> Reno, you got you know Carson City, I think, and then everything else just like empty, vast wasteland of yep. desert, right? And I keep looking at it like with what we have going on in terms of technology and in terms of everything else, why couldn't you build a community out there, right, where people could own, people could you know have the things that they want and go to work in L.A., San Francisco, wherever because you have high speed internet, right? Yeah, I, I'm agreeing with you. And and yet again, I'll say developers and builders are thinking about this now, meaning the, the move towards more master plan communities mm-hmm. as being a mix of the s- traditional single family community. Yeah. Is is that on a, on a maybe less aggressive s- statement of saying, we're going to have to create a, a, a place. Right. The, the, va- the value creation chain is broken. Yeah. On, on the medium to the top part of this equation. So we've got to go in, find dirt, create a, a reason to come here, have mixed use, because otherwise we don't make the, the amount of profit that the risk is is demanding. Right. right. And so I think I think you're right. The, qu- the question in the desert obviously is water. Um, right. And water yeah, sure. in places like Colorado already, water rights is more expensive than the land. Right. That's true. Right. There's just some resource limitations. Um, but like I said, man, my white pill essentially is work from home becomes a permanent landscape, right? Which then mean, and we've already seen this, which is why Atlanta and Austin, Florida, the prices are up 45% year over year, but high prices are cure for high prices. So people go, okay, well, look, I'm going to build something in um, Ohio somewhere where it's way cheaper, but we're going to have gigabit internet to every home and now you could have those people move here right yeah because ultimately it still does come down to do 30 year olds who just got married or have a baby on their way do they want to live in a one-bedroom condo right or do they want to rent or do they want to live in a single wide trailer or an adu in somebody's backyard or do they want their own home do they want a single family house the fence the backyard the dogs the trees all of that right and if it's the latter and the only way you can get it is by moving somewhere you hadn't thought about, mm-hmm. but technology lets you live there. Yeah, you know, I mean that's so that's the, the inflection point in the near term that's going to be hard is that if prices do decrease at all or new construction mm-hmm. is paused, everything reverts closer in because right. that's, that's where affordability is happening. So, but but eventually it, it does come back um, right. to, to, to your point to that. I'm, I'm trying to be white pilled, man. I'm trying to be hopeful. You know, uh, the other. Well, I think white-pilled. have you have you heard of Divi Homes? I think of course. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think Divi is a is a great opportunity to to try to be hopeful as well. I mean, the concept yeah. of you pick the home, we buy it with our cash, you rent from us, but right. unlike t- typical rent, you do get equity that you can then turn into a down payment, right? And become an owner after three years, right? I think um, I think there's ways, and, and the other thing that I'll white pill is uh, that I hinted at is if a builder can find a way to make money off of their customer beyond the initial closing then can we, in essence, kind of subsidize or accept a lower mm-hmm. initial profit margin, um, just like video game systems basically lose money for the first year or two on the mm-hmm. system, and they're going to make money off the software that they sell. Um, right. There are some really interesting things that are potentially coming down the road because the house really is the ultimate platform. Yeah. Uh, what goes in that home, and the builder gets to determine what goes in that home. Yeah. Uh, so there's some really interesting opportunities. Yeah. And the second thing I suppose is I keep thinking, you know, with advanced technology, et cetera, if we could just figure out some advanced in the financing piece, maybe there's much more in terms of like custom spec, not, not spec, custom home build, right? Where more people are just going to want to build their own house, right? And if that could get faster and better technology, maybe this is where some of the technology could come in help handy, right? Where to mm-hmm. your point, so let's have a, in fact, I have a piece of property. I have a half acre. I'm like, oh, maybe I'll build something. But then the traditional building process is, you know, a bunch of dudes rolling up and building a car <laughs> in my garage. If there's better, you know, manufacture, but it's panelized, it's this, and it's more that, and it could be done in two weeks time. You know what I mean? Like maybe that changes things. I mean, so what's the prospect yeah. of something like that from a technological construction innovation standpoint. Uh, it is possible and it's coming soon. 
Um, there's a really interesting company called HiArc that uses um, game, really technologists creating software that lets builders design a home using systems and processes that are standardized. So that like building a video game, you've got a game engine that you create, and then it's relatively easy to make a level because okay. there's rules and systems and 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 that that works. And um, it it creates a house that's designed. It spits out the materials, the list, everything, but it's systematized that it's it's understandable for the contractor who who built your last house understands that this is always the way that Rob Hahn builds his homes or his properties based upon these rules. Mm -hmm. And it's just different parts getting put together in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, there's but but the challenge comes from the again the the rubbing up of the idea the, the desire for customization especially as it, as things are expensive and 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 the kind of best practice or curated designs mm -hmm. and so what we've got to do there's a company called Welcome Homes uh, which is really interesting they only have three floor plans and they only build on your lot. Mm -hmm. But you can pick your home site, you can design your house, uh, visualization galore, because they only have three floor plans. Right. And so we can't, we can't be in a world where every home has to be unique and go down this, this process of standardized manufacturing processes right. in right. what we do. Those, those two <laughs> things are diametrically opposed right now. And you, know, you look at icon and 3d printing of homes. That's fantastic. Um, but it, there, there's also the cultural like it's not it's not the same stigma as living in a double wide but mm -hmm. if you drive down your neighborhood and it looks like concrete poop albeit painted mm -hmm. white yeah and yep. just a we it's just weird it's different and there's a lot of consumers my wife being one of them who's like i mean i save yeah. how much money if i go with that weird looking home no, i'll take the other one yeah 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 i don't think 3d printing homes is there yet i, I just don't see it you know the the technology's not quite there yet um all right we're almost an hour, man. So last white pill, but this is more okay. question concept. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's the idea of um, one of the reasons why you might work at a restaurant is because you get to eat for free. Is there any chance that maybe we solve the labor problem by having home builders say, if you are part of the crew, you get a house for free because you have to build it? I think... Um I'll tell you already, one of the main reasons you would work for a home builder is most home builders will give an employee discount of somewhere between 10 and 15% off the price of a house, which is nothing to, I mean, that, that is a, that can be a significant amount of money that you're saving. Um, right. I think, I think, I think there's something there, uh, whether but it's see, a, the 10 or 15%, you still have to do the down payment, qualify more. I'm literally saying, you know what? You come work yep. and help me build it, this community. One so of the kind of the Ford, the Ford, the Ford idea of, I want all my employees to be able to afford a home, but giving them, giving them a car, um, essentially right, like, right. like, right. um, if it's a different series of homes that, or, or you say you work for me for three years and then I give you this thousand right. square foot home, uh, as part of it. And, maybe every Friday, half the day, the team is working on constructing those homes that are more simple and straightforward, but provides shelter. Yeah. Um, it's not the craziest thing I've heard you say. That's Cause you sure. know, look, I mean, young people can't afford to, we, so here's, here's the two sides of this. One is young people can't afford to buy homes, mm -hmm. right? We have builders who would love to be able to hire young people who are dedicated and will show up on that, et cetera. I'm like, so you're doing a 600, yeah. you know, house development, I don't know how big a crew is, right? You know, to do something like that, right? Say it's sixty. Well, you, so just, in, in the multifamily space, you could absolutely do that because oh, multifamily uh, you know, easy. Yeah. In, in the DC area, you already yeah. have a affordable dwelling unit, a different ADU than the ADU yeah. in your backyard, but you have an affordable dwelling unit to spec for someone who can't afford a home of the average price point in that area. So you could right. just do that voluntarily and say that's set aside for employees. Um, no, no reason you. That, that couldn't be done. I think the difference in another way you're saying it is like Amazon's going to provide you free college tuition. Doesn't that get pretty close right. to the cost of a house? Um, right. But the, again, the profitability levels at, and, and the amount of risk and equity that's in home building, uh, you know, you're, you're just not making in the profit that you would, you know, you put $10 billion into a home building company or $10 billion into Amazon, you're getting a wildly different return on your money. True. And that's true. That's what it, that's what Biden should be trying to figure out how to solve, uh, right. how to incentivize investment in the space. Um, not, I don't not, know. I mean, Congress, uh, you know, finds it real easy to send sixty billions to Ukraine to buy missiles. So 
maybe the next time there's a vote, they'll vote in a hundred billion for home builders, you know? That- <laughs> yeah, I'll hold, uh, I will not hold my breath on that one. I mean, we, we naming the thing, all the things that builders already do that, that ruin the world, right? We cut down trees, we right. um, make the, some rare uh, bird uh, potentially go extinct. So we're already not on many people's favorite so- list. Let's let's leave with this, and I think it's going to be a bit of a black pill, white pill thing. I don't know which way you're going to come out. All right. Okay. So here's the thing. Like I said, the thing that I'm terrified of, that I'm most worried about, is the current housing problem, the unaffordability, the economy we're in, will make younger people, millennials and Gen Z, right, basically turn towards you know what we need we need price control, we need rent control, we need the government to come and save us from these greedy builders and landlords, etc which all that does is it causes economic dislocation, shortages, it makes things far worse. Is what, if anything, do you think could be done for home builders, realtors, for the industry to educate the younger generation who are going to be the majority of voters that the solution really is more supply, making things easier to build homes and maybe not having some of these local stupid zoning rules and such that make it harder. I mean, what do you think the chances are of educating the younger generation of that? I think I'm going black pill. (laughs) 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 Because, I mean, even when you're saying that, as the the builder in me, right, I I want to have more housing availability because I agree with you, affordable housing is a huge problem. At the same time, I will tell you that most builders are still not making a 10% net profit margin right. on, on what they're doing. And so at the same time, you also say, let's bring on a whole bunch. Of th- what does that mean? That means uh, I'm going to make 5%. Well, then I'm not going to build. So again, right. the the middle to top of the value creation chain is broken in, in our industry right now. And, and the only right. way that that gets solved, most builders have become developers of the communities they're building because that's the dirt and turning the dirt into an approved community is where the biggest value creation happens in terms mm. of profit right now. Right. The home building, and I mean, even mortgages and title, all the same stuff that I hear agents and brokers and everyone in your world fight about all the time. Builders are the same way. If they didn't have a JV with a mortgage company, a lot of them would not be in Build. a great place. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, I know you're going to you, you, you leave us with black pill. That's <laughs> fine. So how about this? Leave us with a, with a white pill. Um, okay, so so the white pill is that we don't have a homelessness problem due to a lack of housing. I think the opportunity is for builders to create houses that customers need now, and um, you know we don't need houses that are three thousand square feet. We don't need four and five bedroom homes, uh, and, and so there is a chance that we we do a better job as builders at creating a, a better product market fit and understand that. Uh, you, designing a home that can be built under two hundred thousand dollars might not be the home that you want to live in, but it's going to get people further towards their dream, or at least get them started on their ultimate dream that you that you keep talking about. Everyone's still wanting, than just saying that's impossible and let's just start from the three fifties. I think right. I think I think that's what builders have to do is let, let's get them started on owning something. Right. That's the only way All that right. they're going to gain wealth. All right. Well, uh, like, I feel like you and I, we could probably talk for a few hours. We didn't even get to talk really about Open Door or I know. <laughs> we'll just have to do this again is what it means. You Anytime. know, whether on your show or my show, like we, we just got to keep doing this. Uh, if uh, if people want to find you, uh, where, where would they find you, Kevin? I've worked very hard to say this. When someone asks me for a business card, I say the same thing. Just Google Kevin Oakley. Type in Kevin Oakley in the Google. And, uh, and we'll pop up. You can go to doconvert.com, reach out on LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, right a- anywhere. But yeah, if you have a question specifically about home building, I don't have anything to sell you. So that's I'll right. just answer your question. <laughs> that's right. Hey, thanks very much for uh, joining me and for the conversation. We'll do this again and we'll talk about whatever the next big thing is or open door or whatever we got to talk about, man. This is a real pleasure. Yeah, I, I think we have to help bridge the the disconnect between what agents believe about builders and what builders believe about agents yeah for sure for sure all right thanks see ya all right later